Good, good morning, and thank you for coming. My name is Debbie Rose. <laughs> and I'm the chair of the Committee on Youth Services. And today we will be hearing two pieces of legislation, proposed intro number seven, 376A, which was introduced by Council Member Torres, and intro number 713, which was introduced by Council Member Van Bramer and myself. Proposed intro number 376A would establish an anti-bullying hotline and provide additional resources for youth, including a mobile device application. And intro number 713 would create an ombudsman's position within the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development, DYCD, to serve runaway and homeless youth, RHY. Um, and I would first like to thank Speaker Corey Johnson for his strong commitment to these issues and advocacy. He has, he has shown great leadership on this issue regarding youth, especially within the RHY community. As demonstrated by his unwavering support for runaway and homeless youth bills that have recently been enacted. I look forward to working with him in the future on these pressing issues. I would also like to thank all of the young people, advocates and providers who are here to testify on behalf of these bills, as well as acknowledge my colleagues who have joined us. Council Member Margaret Chin. Thank you. As pertaining to proposed <laughs> intro number 376A by Council Member Torres, bullying remains a large problem throughout the United States and in our city, especially within the youth population. In the Department of Education's annual NYC school survey, it was reported that more students in the New York City public schools experienced or witnessed bullying at their schools in 2017 as compared to 2016. In 2017, 81% of nearly 435,000 students surveyed from grades six to 12 responded that students harass, bully, and intimidate their peers. This represents an alarming 10% increase in just one year. These figures suggest that bullying may be on the rise in public schools throughout the city. The Department of Education has taken a number of steps to address bullying among nearly 1.1 million students. But we all know too well, bullying just doesn't stop at the public school's exit. It can follow students all the way home to their communities. It can impact the homeschooled and students in private schools. It can even impact young people who have since graduated or aged out of school. And the consequences are even more profound with LGBT youth. This is why proposed intro number 376A is so important. This bill would establish an anti-bullying hotline and other resources, including a mobile device application to help young people respond to and seek help against the devastating consequences of bullying. Moreover, these resources would be available to all youth, not just those attending a public school. In addition, we are hearing intro number 713 by Council Member Van Bramer. This bill would create an ombudsman's position within DYCD to serve the runaway and homeless youth population. Runaway and homeless youth experience high rates of physical, emotional, and so sexual abuse that are compounded by poverty and unstable housing, and they require extra services and assistance to become independent and successful individuals. According to the Mayor's Management Report, in fiscal year 2017, DYCD funded programs for runaway and home homeless youth served over 25,000 youth, and that number may increase as more vulnerable RHY you seek support and services through DYCD programs. An ombudsman would be responsible for establishing a system to receive complaints, comments regarding any DYC funded program or facility that serves runaway and homeless youth, monitoring all runaway and homeless youth programs and facilities to ensure compliance with DYCD 
contractual obligations, investigating and taking appropriate action regarding complaints received, and making recommendations to the commissioner that could improve programs and facilities. The ombudsman would also prepare monthly reports outlining its accomplishments and how it is responding to runaway and homeless youth issues and, and, com and complaints. And finally, a yearly report would be submitted to the mayor and the speaker of the city council to inform us regarding the ombudsman's efforts and help us to further our support for DYCD and our shared mandate to assist the runaway and homeless youth population. We want to acknowledge the efforts that New York State Office of Family and Children's Services have provided through its own ombudsman's program and, and office. Indeed, many runaway and homeless youth are referred to programs because of their involvement in the court system. They benefit from the state resource. However, the goals of the state ombudsman are to serve court-placed youth. They do not touch the many other youth in our system who need an ombudsperson to help them navigate the resources available to raise the issues, complaints, that impact their safety and security in our system. Having a dedicated ombudsman in DYCD would not only help youth, um, help youth the state ombudsman does not reach, but also enhance transparency and accountability within DYCD runaway and homeless youth programs. I look forward to hearing the testimony today regarding these exciting bills, and I would like to thank the council staff for their work today to prepare today's hearing. Council, Paul Senegal, Policy Analyst, Kevin Katowski, and Finance Analyst, Jessica Ackerman. I would also like to thank my staff, Edwina Martin, and Lisa, and Issa, for their work on this committee. And now, um, we'll swear in our first- Good morning. Um, in accordance with the rules of the council, I will administer the affirmation to the witnesses from the mayoral administration. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Okay, you can, may lower your hands and please state your names for the record. Well, good morning, my name is um, Randy Scott. I'm Susan Haskell, Deputy Commissioner, DYCD. And Daryl Ratchery, Associate Commissioner, DYCD. Good morning. Good morning. Um, begin your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, um, Chair Rose and members of the Committee on Youth Services. My name is Susan Haskell, and I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Youth Services at the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development. I'm joined by Randy Scott, Assistant Commissioner for Vulnerable and Special Needs Youth and Daryl Rattray, Associate Commissioner, Community Centers and Strategic Partnerships. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. On behalf of Commissioner Chong, we want to extend thanks to the City Council for your ongoing support of DYCD and commitment to the city's young people. As partners, we have worked closely to expand services to reach more youth and communities across the city. Quality program is so critical in supporting the development of New York City's young people. We appreciate the spirit and intent of intro 376A and intro 713. We are pleased to say that DYCD and the administration have initiatives in place that help prevent bullying and address emotional or behavioral issues that may stem from bullying, peer pressure, or other issues. DYCD also has practices and procedures for young people to make comments and or complaints regarding the programs and services they receive and that um, more generally serve to alert DYCD to any problematic issues or needs. DYCD is committed to ensuring that our funded programs are welcoming, positive, and engaging environments for young people. We provide assistance to our funded providers to create safe and supportive settings through training, coaching, dissemination of best practices. At this time, I'd like to offer our comments to both bills. I'll start with 376A which seeks to amend the New York City Charter in relation to establishing an anti-bullying hotline and additional resources for youth. 
We are pleased to say that the requirements and goals for intro 376A are being met by existing commitments and resources. Bullying prevention has been a significant priority for this administration. Uh, on just October 30th, 2017, former Chancellor Farina announced a package of anti-bullying programs and reforms to be implemented within the Department of Education. The package includes trainings and workshops for students, teachers and school personnel on topics such as mental health, social emotional learning, anti-bias and anti-bullying. And furthermore, in 2019, DOE will launch a bullying complaint portal that will be an easy to use tool for families to report online incidents of student discrimination, harassment, intimidation, and or bullying against their children. The DOE website also contains extensive respect for all resources for students, families, and educators. Most young people in New York City and in DYCD funded programs attend DOE schools and would be supported by these new and current resources. DYCD will work closely with DOE to promote these initiatives through email blasts, social media that can reach DYCD's hundreds of providers and tens of thousands of youth participants. DYCD funds youth development program that is designed to promote positive social norms, create physical and psychological safety, opportunities for leadership and belonging, and supportive relationships with caring adults and peers. These programmatic elements prevent and combat bullying and help youth develop positively. Recognizing the impact that bullying can have on young people, many DYCD funded programs incorporate anti-bullying efforts directly into their program activities. For example, this year's theme of DYCD's annual Step It Up Dance competition is anti-bullying. And in addition to competing through dance, the teams also compete through creating engaging public service announcement videos that address bullying and highlight strategies to prevent it. To help programs address emotional and behavioral issues, DYCD offers capacity building workshops, mental health first aid trainings, provider convenings on positive youth development, and support to offer leadership development to young people. DYCD engages in extensive outreach to ensure young people and their families are aware of the opportunities that we provide. Through DYCD's Youth Connect 1-800 number, callers can learn about the broad array of DYCD funded programs and identify nearby programs available in their neighborhood. New Yorkers can also learn about the location of programs through Discover DYCD, a web-based service locator tool. In addition to helping New Yorkers find resources, Youth Connect's resource specialists can receive complaints and concerns from the public regarding DYCD services. While Youth Connect does not provide training or counseling directly, the resource specialist can connect youth to an appropriate resource. For example, the Thrive NYC's initiative, NYC Well, chat, text, and call-in hotline allows young New Yorkers to obtain crisis counseling, support, information, and referral to additional resources and mental health providers if they're experiencing stress, anxiety, or other mental health concerns that could be attributed to being bullied. NYC Well counselors and peers are trained to recognize bullying and be compassionate and supportive listeners for the young persons in this type of situation. For very serious situations in which a youth is experiencing acute behavioral or mental health issue related to bullying, NYC Well can refer the individual to the Children's Rapid Response Mobile Crisis Team. These teams provide interventions including crisis de-escalation, psychosocial assessments, prevention planning, and collaboration with educators to support families and caregivers. I'd now like to offer comments on Intro 713, which seeks to create an ombudsman position within DYCD for runaway and homeless programs. Through DYCD-funded programs, vulnerable runaway and homeless youth can access high-quality programs that offer shelter, meet their basic needs, and connect them to other resources such as health and mental health services. We agree it's important for young people to offer feedback on services to ensure that they get the support that they need and alert us when improvements are needed, and we would be happy to continue to discuss this work with the council. Since DYCD's RHY programs are governed by New York State Runaway and Homeless Youth Act, its regulations establish the role of Runaway and Homeless Youth Services Coordinator in each county. This state-defined role functions as the ombudsman for DYCD. New York City's RHY Services Coordinator is Assistant Commissioner Randy Scott. Um, Section 182.1.15 of the regulations outlines the role of the RHY Services Coordinator to include the following responsibilities. Development and implementation of county plans with the County Youth Bureau to improve services for runaway and homeless youth and their families. Identification, assessment, and monitoring 
of all available county resources for runaway homeless youth and their families, ensuring a systems in place for responding to inquiries concerning available shelter space, transportation, and services 24 hours per day, ensuring that program youth have access to educational services, including transportation, considering requests of runaway and homeless youth have appropriate written consent from their parent, guardian, or legal custodian, custodian to remain in runaway and homeless youth shelters beyond the 120 day maximum length of stay. DYCD also has several practices and procedures in place to receive and investigate comments and complaints, which also fulfills the roles of the proposed ombudsman described in intro 713. They include the following. As part of our plan to encourage youth to share their experiences, at each DYCD funded RHY program site, providers are required to place a sign in multiple languages that notifies and encourages participants to call 311 with any concerns, issues, or complaints. Those reports are directed to DYCD and the RHY services coordinator. Additionally, if an incident recurs at a DYCD funded program site, DYCD providers are required to submit an incident report to DYCD and if the incident is serious to notify OCFS. RHY regulations mandate reports to the New York State Justice Center for the Protection of People with Special Needs, also called the Justice Center, an independent state entity for abuse, neglect, or significant incidents in RHY residential programs. As part of overall monitoring, DYCD's RHY program managers make several site visits annually to monitor program quality, both announced and unannounced. Each site visit revolts, results in a program quality review report, which includes any areas in need of improvement. As a regular part of site monitoring, the program manager will speak with young people enrolled in the program to learn about the quality of their experience. Direct complaints or concerns from young people have also come to our attention through provider staff from other programs, through youth focus groups, youth advisory boards, emails, and phone calls to the commissioner's office or the mayor's communication portal. DYCD investigates all complaints or concerns that are brought to our attention, including interviews with the youth at the relevant site, whether or not those complaints were submitted anonymously. It also includes interviews with provider staff and investigation of cited issues. Appropriate solutions, follow-up, or disciplinary actions or program improvements are identified. As we've testified today, DYCD and the administration are committed to ensuring that the city's young people can access quality programming in safe, welcoming, and positive program environments and can offer feedback to improve services. We look forward to the continued partnership with the City Council to meet the needs of the city's youth and create opportunities for them to grow and thrive. Thank you again for the chance to testify and we are ready to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony this morning. Um, and so it's, it's really good to hear that DYCD um, is uh, providing services to um, this population. And so um, my concern is that there, we've seen an increase in, um, in, in bullying in, um, in the uh, last year. So a 10% increase. So um, with these resources that you have in place, um, what would you attribute this uh, increase in bullying to? Um, I, I don't have a clear answer for that, but I do appreciate that in general, there's been more attention paid to the needs of young people who are being bullied. Um, I think through our work to, for, on mental health and through DYCD's commitment to social emotional learning and the efforts of the Department of Admin, in, uh, Education, we have, there's been more overall attention paid to that issue and I hope that the rise in reporting is due to young people finding, um, being more uh, able to report those incidences and feeling more supported that if they do support it that um, they'll be provided help. So do, you, um, do you think that the resources that we have in place are adequate? Well, I think the, um, that the goals of this bill are going to be met with existing commitments. And I know that the work underway at Department of Education specifically to really ramp up their efforts to be responsive to bullying calls are still underway. 
So just last week, they um, uh, updated the portal on the Respect for All website of Department of Education. Mm -hmm. um, they have uh, connected with 311 for um, resources in response to phone calls. And in 2019, their um, plan is to ramp up the technology on that portal so that they are able to do better tracking, better responsiveness, better immediate connection to the appropriate people at the school. And so, but that portal and those resources are primarily for in-school youth, are they not? They are, um, they are primarily for in-school youth. Um, they, any student in public um, charter or private could also look for resources through the UFT that provides anti-bullying um, services that can be available through 311. And if a young person, for example, is um, goes to a charter school, also a, a public school, they would be referred to the Office of Charter Schools um, for, for So support. do you think that, um, that a DYCD hotline and application um, would be effective in addressing bullying that occurs outside of school, outside of public schools, um, such as in private schools or in communities? We know that bullying follows um, young people. It, it doesn't stop at the door um, when the school day is over. And especially now with um, cyberbullying being as prevalent as it is. So um, do you think that, you know, DYCD having a anti-bullying hotline would, um, that would be accessible to all young people in New York City um, would, be, would be helpful? We think that it would be duplicative of the resources that are being um, planned at DOE. We are concerned that it might possibly even be um, disruptive um, in terms of data collection and follow through to, in, to implement a separate bullying hotline. And um, I think one exciting thing about DYCD's role in responding mm -hmm. to bullying is that our primary goal in the young people that we connect with is positive youth development. So we, it, all of our programs are framed around the concept, the primary goal, concept of creating positive relationships with caring adults, connecting peers to positive relationship with other young people, to promote like pro-social behavior, and to give a young person who might be inclined to be a bully, um, and to get you know whatever they're getting social emotionally from that experience instead through learning new skills and being <coughs> successful. Um, so I think we address that issue directly through our programming. But there is no dedicated anti-bullying hotline that's available for New York City youth who find themselves um, in a situation that they need a I, response to. Um, 311 I, is a, a general line and you get referred to to the, the uh, depart to the Department of Education, we feel that's going to address virtually all young people who are in this um, situation. And but that's if they're a, a school, they're a school student. That's not someone just just a youth who is out of school, someone who's aged out of school. So, you know, where is the res resource for that targeted population? I think that that is being addressed directly through the new investments in Thrive NYC Well. So all young people, uh, this would be sort of a more older, disconnected youth that you're describing, I think, and all young people and adults are being encouraged to call 188 NYC Well. You can chat. Well, it doesn't have to be older, um, you know, young people. Who are We're talking about the LGBT community and Q community that, you know, suffers probably disproportionately yes. from um, bullying also. I, I think that NYC Well is going to capture um, young people who may not reach out for support directly through 311 or Department of Education. And with that resources, they, ac they actually can get counseling immediately through, through the connection with NYC Well. Um, through the 311 or the um, DYCD, uh, DOE bullying resources, they'll be directed to appropriate school personnel. Thrive can offer immediate response. Just, just to, to add to um, 
And I think one of the things that we have to do is definitely check in with DOE on their details. I'm not 100% sure that it's only isolated for, the resource will only be for students. Mm -hmm. um, that perhaps it'll be other resources and referrals happening through that hotline. You know, through our programming, we'll make the effort um, to partner with DOE on this, get the word out, make sure our providers are um, informing the, the neighborhoods about this new resource. But we'll definitely check in with DOE and on the details of whether or not it's only for students. I, I don't believe that to be the case. I just, um, you know, a, a point that, you know, I think is important is that um, a young person who is in crisis and reaches out to a hotline that would directly serve them right then interactively is different from calling 311 and getting, you know, a list of other phone uh, numbers to call. And by the time you actually reach someone um, or you've gone through several steps, you know, they might have decided it's, you know, it's just more effort than, than not, you know. So I think there's real value in having a dedicated hotline that would respond you know, interactively to a young person who feels that, who has made the courageous step to reach out for help. Because we know oftentimes they're so intimidated that they don't. And so, you know, I, I think any gap in, in that moment where, you know, they say, you know, I'm going to deal with this and to be referred on is, uh, is a lost opportunity for helping that young person. I appreciate that, and we agree. We think mm -hmm. NYC Well is a great resource for that immediate support somebody who mm -hmm. can connect you at the in the ex most extreme example to a mobile crisis team right then and there. So what does DYCD do to promote um, these uh, resources so that um, a young person in New York City would know where to go and, and how to go and and if they wanted an immediate you know um, interaction um, that they should go to Thrive or Yeah, I'm going to well. ask, um, I'm going to respond briefly about um, about the Thrive efforts and then to ask um, Associate okay. Commissioner Rattray to talk about what happens at the programmatic level. Um, but DYCD has been actively involved in the First Lady's um, town halls. We've been going out to communities to talk to young people and adults about this resource. We've been connecting with providers to promote the, you know, including chance to repeat the number to ensure that people remember. Internally to DYCD, we are all being trained um, about the mental health resources so that we can carry that forth to our providers and our providers can carry it forth to young people. I know I personally am getting, you know, questions from, you know, like as we all do from, um, from neighbors and friends and I'm excited that I can offer them a resource through Thrive. Do you provide training to um, to all of the, the different providers and contractors that you? So our direction starts with a document called Dignity and Respect for All, um, creating and maintaining a welcoming environment. All of our providers receive that document. Uh, it speaks to creating a safe space within your programs. We see that show up in different ways at every program site. For instance, um, at West Brighton in Staten Island, um, they create bully-free zones. So they are directly working with elementary students um, within the after-school program, middle and high as well, mm -hmm. um, but on what does bullying mean? What does it mean to bully? What are some of the direct bullying um, tactics that go on? And what are some of the indirect? So young people are now learning that, um, for instance, for example, um, because someone's a male, they shouldn't be, you shouldn't tell them that you're, you should be strong enough to pick up that box and that there are different forms of bullying. Um, and they're learning this at the elementary age across our programs. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I love that we're educating the young people. Are we doing any training with, with the adults that are providing these services? Yes, we are. Um, currently, we part of the Thrive initiative was that we were going to train not only um, our staff, but we were working on training um, our provider agencies, and we have started that process to bring mental health first aid to our providers in many different um, training sessions. 
as well as with Thrive NYC, the funding that we received allowed for us to, uh, for the providers to have um, trained staff on, on board in order to readily um, and expeditiously um, assist youth with any um, mental health issues that should arise and provide them with the services. So there is training as well as there is on-site staff that can assist at the moment. Um, does DYCD um, hold a contract Thrive NYC programs? We, within our um, contracted um, programming, there is Thrive dollars associated with the um, bottom line right. for runaway and homeless youth. Um, so in our drop-in centers, in our um, residential programs, they receive funding to either bring staff on to provide services in mental health um, situations or trainings. We also allow for them to um, do psycho, um, psych evaluations, um, work groups, um, creative um, art therapy, so things that are identified on site as immediate needs for youth who um, identify with mental health um, issues, so they are able to be creative in using the funding for that purpose. Okay, uh, I'm going to follow up, but um, Council Member Chin has some questions, and uh, today's a busy day. Uh, everybody's um, at hearings or something. Two as hearings you can going see. on at the same time. Right. Which, so, I'm on um, both committees. So Council thank Member you, Chin. Thank you. I just want to follow up on uh, what Chair Rose been was talking about in terms of the um, the anti-bullying hotline. Um, I know that from your testimony, you know, DYCD is is doing a lot with providers, and if some of the youth, if they're lucky enough to be in a DYCD program, most likely they would, you know, have access to resources. But have you considered, you know, that the term bullying is really getting out there, and to have a dedicated uh, way of getting information, whether it's through a phone line and now you know, with all these mobile application, that might be another way for people to, to act, young people to access. And some of these young people might not be in our public schools. Uh, they might have dropped out or they're in um, private school, parochial school, whatever. But just the, the fact of getting some direct assistance right away. I mean, when we were talking about, you know, the WELL program, the Thrive program, in some way, there's still a taboo that kids don't want to, they don't want to say, oh, I got a mental health issue. No, people, adults, there's still a taboo out there on that. But the fact that if you can have a direct contact, I mean, even with that hotline, you can directly connect it to whatever other programs or other information. Calling 311 is like a non-starter. You know, people are very frustrated a lot of time. When they really need concrete information, 311 is not the most effective. So I think mean, what we are asking is that with the legislation, it's like, have you, you know, considered this as a resource that you can help the kids that call this number and to be able to really help guide them, direct them to the resources that, that you already have? We do think that the resources that the city has in place through DOE will cover young people. You mentioned prior private, we mentioned charter, and then there's also getting into disconnected youth who you know, do mostly tend to be older, although there could be younger people in those situations as well. I want to be clear, DYCD does have a hotline. We have Youth Connect, um, which we market for all kinds of young people's needs. The data, uh, the data on Youth Connect bullying calls is very minimal. So in the past, it's very years, minimal is because they don't see that as a, a place where they can get some help directly. Some, I mean, that's the whole thing about publicizing. Not everybody even know that you have a Youth Connect uh, phone line. I mean, there was from other hearings that we were talking about, you know, runaway homeless youth trying to find a bed, and so I think that really to kind of open up and see how we can use different resources to, to reach the vulnerable kids, kids yeah. who need help. Well, in uh, contrast to the Youth Connect data, um, in, in briefly speaking with DOE, and I don't have all their data here, but in just since January, they had more than 450 calls coming into their hotline. 
So I do, I am concerned to your point about like marketing and people awareness that the more straightforward we keep our resources, the better data we're gonna have on what kinds of calls are coming in and being responsive. And the, the more we can streamline our marketing. Our goal is to support what DOE is doing so that if a young person is connected with DYCD, less connected with the schools, we will be able to help direct them to the right way, either through Thrive or DOE. I think we really need to look at the data and also hear from the advocates why you know that is not sufficient, and we still got to find ways of getting you know information to kids who really needs the help. Um, then that's why you know reason for these legislation, and hopefully we can you know come up with um, new ideas, or whatever um, ways of reaching the, the kids and the, the parents. Uh, because it's still happening out there, and uh, bullying is, um, if you talk to any kids in school, sure. but for them to really get the resources or the kids in the neighborhood, we don't want them to think that it's a rite of passage, that everybody got to get bullied when, when you're young. No, there are help out there, there are resources, so we're just trying to find a way of making sure people know how to get the help they need. And Council Member, we are, we are absolutely in agreement that this has been a thread of um, importance over the years through our programming. Um, through our special initiatives that we do, whether it's our dance competitions or some of the, the um, really specific things that programs are doing in neighborhoods, this has always been a theme that they take on. So like for instance, in our Step It Up dance competition that was mentioned in testimony, um, imagine dance teams um, that are thinking that they're part of a dance competition, but now they find out in the opening that you have to take on a social campaign. This year, the campaign is anti-bullying. And what we're seeing is um, providers, um, dance teams, there's one in East New York, um, Team Diversity, where their, their campaign is anti-immigrant bullying. Um, and now this dance team is now empowered to speak to the residents, speak to the other program participants, rally them, go out there, get the word out. Um, this is happening across the city um, in many of our programs and many of the initiatives that we do. Another really interesting one is um, Rock Nation and Far Rockaway. That dance team took on the efforts to stop body shaming um, as a form of anti-bullying approach. Um, in the Bronx, Live Dance Love, that dance team is looking at cultural bullying um, and focusing on um, cultural wear, beliefs, and practices. And again, these are young adults who stepped into this for performance and now have been empowered to take on this larger role in their community. And the, the, on social media, the numbers are out there, they're getting the word out. I mean, that's just one example of the platform that we have through providers to youth development and community development. Like if we concentrate on one hotline, the DOE hotline, and get the word out, and we'll speak with DOE to ensure that it's not just a student. Like, you know, it's, someone calls, are you a student? Yes, no, if not, call someone else. And we'll make sure that the proper resources are there, we'll speak with them about the hearing as well as, as you should as well. Um, but we need to concentrate efforts on one hotline that young people know about, one social media platform that young people know about um, to help com combat this issue. It's great that DYCD is doing all this program and that's the challenge that I wanna put to DYCD. When every single young people in our city can participate in our DYCD program and they can get all that. But right now, that's not the case, okay? Because DYCD don't have enough funding to fund an after-school program for all our kids in public school, in elementary school. We have universal middle school kids, universal. but no summer, okay? Yeah. Which we don't agree with. But we don't even have universal after-school program for every single public school elementary school student. If we have, you could be reaching out to all the parents and all those kids. I mean, they would be participating in all these programs, but we're not there. And we need to be there. So every one of them will have the opportunity to get the resources that they need. And that's the challenge that I have for DYCD. You gotta expand. You know, don't be satisfied with the budget you have now. You gotta make sure every kid have an after school program and tell that to the to commissioner. All right, we're not there yet. Until the day that we have that, we still got work to do. Thank you.
Thank you, Chair. I got to go to housing. <laughs> <laughs> Give them hell, Margaret. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, council member. Um, uh, on that note, you're, you're saying that um, Youth Connect is, um, is a, a platform that or a resource for young people to access. So um, are there any plans uh, for you to maybe appropriate or expand it so that it actually has a function where it is an interactive bully, anti-bullying hotline as opposed to just a referral mechanism. Um, and so um, that a young person could call there and could actually have sort of an intervention instead of, again, going through a, a drop-down list of services that are provided and um, a number of other people that they have to call to access it. Um, is, is there any conversation around looking at um, uh, appropriating that site or expanding that site so that it has this particular um, feature so that you know, it's, it's actually addressing the need of someone who finds themselves in a bullying situation. Um, currently, Youth Connect doesn't provide that kind of counseling. I know it doesn't. We are putting our attention on the new and significant resources through NYC Well and DOE so that if a young person does come to the attention of Youth Connect, they can alert, they can connect them with those resources. We, we think that that need is being met through those resources, that we have existing services to meet that need. Are you aware of any of the other social media platforms or um, mobile apps that are out there that address anti-bullying, that address bullying? Uh, I mentioned in the test, uh, I think in the testimony that the UFT has resources for right. school mm -hmm. children in public and private. Mm -hmm. Um, outside of the city, I'm aware of the Trevor Project has a resource, there's a runaway, and a national runaway hotline, yeah. there's, um, yeah, D Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. So I know there are other, other that are... Yeah. Is there any move to sort of coalesce with, you know, um, some of these uh, more interactive, direct, you know... Um, Yes, I think, that, I think that is a, a responsibility of Youth Connect and of course 311 as well to be aware of available resources and connect young people to the right ones. Yes, I do think that's, that coordination is part of our goal. So let's say um, that we're just going to really push hard on this. What, would it, um, what do you think the anticipated cost would be to um, build um, an anti-bullying hotline and the, the related um, resources that you would need to do that? I, I don't know. I know that DOE has just committed millions, some, something in the territory of $8 million to their um, efforts, and that's a significant investment, and it's a large reason why we want to keep focus on, on that. So do you have access to um, DOE's the, the data that they have, that they get from these programs that um, you're, you're connected to? We could do better in communicating with them on these. We've been in touch with them recently. As I mentioned, they shared that they had 450 calls since January. Um, but we could look into opportunities to coordinate better in terms of what we can learn to provide better services through DYCD by hearing the kinds of complaints and issues that are coming through to them. I think that's a good idea and we will be in closer touch with them following this hearing. Do you have oversight of these, um, the sites and, and the DOE programs? Absolutely no. not, no. no. And so um, in response to, um, if you knew the numbers, then you would try to provide different services or adequate services or I can, uh, some, additional some examples, services? Yeah, some examples I can think of is 
you know, if DOE reported that there were many calls coming into this certain neighborhood, many calls coming in regarding this specific school, then I think DYCD could have a role to um, say, like, hey, what's going on in that neighborhood? Let's look at our community centers mm -hmm. and see if we can do some outreach. It's what very, kind of very, bullying is it? Is very it similar to work that we do now with the mayor's office to combat domestic violence. And the areas that we know have a high um, report of domestic violence, we now work with them to do workshops for young people, young adults, mm -hmm. um, relationship workshops, dating workshops, um, to start to bring that down, hopefully. Do you get called, um, again, data regarding the, the 311 calls that are um, related to bullying? We get data, as I said, we had very few, like something in the range of five or six bullying calls um, through 311 to Youth Connected. So there's really like nobody like monitoring um, how many calls sort of come in um, in terms of, of bullying. Oh, I, I think that is monitored closely, absolutely. What I'm responding to is that um, there might be an opportunity, especially through the expanded portal in 2019 that's going to have more information for DYCD to play a role to respond to those that information. Um, they, DOE is, again, part of their significant resources has been increasing their team. It's going to be very closely monitored, just like 311 is. I mean, we get detailed information from 311 about calls in areas related to DYCD, yes. What mechanism is out there to capture um, the numbers in terms of bullying for young people who are not um, affiliated with DOE or a charter school who are just out there? There will be data through NYC Well. There's our own data through 311 Youth Connect or you know simple email communication. And then DOE will have robust data regarding their um, efforts. So I'm going to ask the question. Do you think that um, the efforts that are in place now are adequate? I think that even DOE is planning to expand those efforts. So I, their plans include increased resources from what we have currently. So I think the city ha has already committed to expanding the resources that are available, and those efforts are already underway. By, by 2019, they, f they anticipate having fully implemented the portal and the data information. And is anyone um, developing a mobile app to to deal with uh, bullying? I don't know about, I don't know if that's part of their plan. I'm not, this I'm not is the 21st century and, and yeah. I don't know any young person that's not connected. Well, uh, you, you can, know. I mean, you can get to, you can get to the portal through your phone for sure. Mm -hmm. It's on the web. Mm -hmm. um, but an, I, I, an well, I app to that to, would to address it. We can reach out to DOE and get back to you. Um, I just want to say, um, you know, you should be commended for the work that you're doing in terms of, of prevention. Um, a long time ago, DYCD moved away from prevention to intervention. And I'm really glad to see that um, you're handling, you know, this crisis in terms of prevention and education. Um, however, that's, that is a process and it takes time. You're, you're changing a mindset. You're, you're instilling a, a value system. Um, so that takes time. So I really need DYCD to see that we need something to deal with the immediacy of bullying as opposed to, not as in addition to, because I think the efforts that are being made in terms of prevention and long term, and and are really exciting, and they're they're through the um, the types of activities that young people relate to, and um, but again, uh, to piggyback on Councilmember Chin's you know um, statement, we're not reaching nearly enough young people to have a sort of a universal impact. So, um, Councilman, uh, I just, mm -hmm. just want to add that, um, I mean, across the city every day, our, our providers, our programs intervene in situations that are bullying situations. Mm -hmm. um, because of their makeup, because of the youth development, community development approach, you know, they know the parents, they know siblings, they know the people who are not part of the program but are outside in the neighborhood. And they're able to interact with them, engage, mediate that situation. 
uh, we have examples where in East Harlem, there was a young man being bullied. Um, the program intervened. It happened to be a gang that, a crew that um, the young man was dealing with, who actually had interactions with the program. And they were able to mediate that situation um, to a better outcome. So I mean, there are things that are happening through providers every day. Uh -huh. um, just through the, the normal operating of the program, of the after school program, of the community center, um, in terms of prevention and engagement and mediation. Okay, thank you. You look like you have something you wanna say. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's just gonna ditto. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just gonna ditto, <laughs> huh? smile. That's how that works. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Okay, so um, I, I think you probably will have more to say about the next um, the next bill, which is uh, 713, I believe. Um, um, in terms of 713 and, and the request um, to have an ombudsman um, to, to handle the complaints and the issues of runaway and homeless youth, um, you cited that you know you are regulated often by the Office of Family and Children's Services state state mandates, um, but is that not only just for the court um, mandated young people who are in these facilities? Um, no, as the runaway and homeless youth coordinator, I'm. Um, responsible for the youth in New York City in terms of um, providing them with the services that they need when they go to any of the certified runaway and homeless youth facilities, um, as well as when they go to our drop-in centers and they work with our street outreach team. So I basically am available to them um, for any concerns or questions, suggestions that they may have um, at any given time in order to provide them with the best resource so that they can um, you know, aim to get back to independence if that's the um, path that they so choose. So um, how do they get access to you? There's many forms that they can um, have access to me. The one is through focus groups that we um, hold through at- what? I'm sorry. Focus groups. Focus groups. That we hold at um, different times. Also through um, our, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Also through our um, monthly youth provider meetings that we have at um, our site. I also um, am available to go to the sites and speak to young people in that forum. We also have the ability to talk to them from directly because they have access to my um, telephone number to call me if they should choose to do so. My cell phone as well as my um, office phone. So I've um, communicated as well as met with youth in those forums. So do you have staff? Yes, I do. Okay. And so 24-hour um, staffing? I have staff that are 24 hours, um, as well as myself is um, 24 hours. So if I'm a, a young person who um, has a, a, a crisis at 3 a.m., I call you? The likelihood is that you would be calling me first, correct, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and my number has been provided in past hearings in terms of allowing youth to have access to my um, direct line. And um, how many youth are we talking about that's in the system? That's in our or system. That you um, serve. For fiscal year 17 in our crisis shelters, we served about anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 youth, which um, in our crisis services, in our TILs, that number is a little bit lower to about, I would say, 250 to 300. And in um, drop-in centers, which is a duplicated number, it's around 10,000 to 11,000 youth. But again, that's a duplicated number. Mm -hmm. I wanted that's to, can I add something? Sure. I think one thing that differentiates DYCD from other residential programs like you describe, where there's custody in foster care or detention, is that um, DYCD doesn't provide direct service to young people. So I think their first line of defense really is our funded providers. So they'd be less likely to know about DYCD than they would be to know about the drop-in center in Harlem or the Jamaica Center that's now open 24 hours in Queens 
um, or to be connected with the Safe Horizon Street Outreach Team that's going around. I don't, uh, although Randy is available 24-7 and has received um, late night phone calls, more, it's, it would be much more typical for a young person to connect with the funded provider. And I think, although we call the role in New York City the RHY, the, the Runaway and Homeless Youth Services Coordinator, we don't use the word ombudsman, um, the role that Randy plays um, in New York City is, is, is uh, sort of an ombudsman for young people who are getting those services directly through providers. So they, would, they, would, um, they could either contact Randy about a concern that they're having with one of the providers or maybe um, you know, they're not happy with, with some service they got, then he, kind of, he performs an ombudsman role in that way. To the direct service. Um, we've been joined by Council Member Eugene. Um, and uh, again, it's a busy day, so do you have a question before we want to go? Uh, not really. Thank you very much. Okay. I just want to, uh, to thank the, uh, the panelists for coming for the, this very important uh, public hearing. We know that, that the young people, they are close to our heart and that they deserve so much and uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Um, so, if I'm a young person in a facility and I have an issue with that facility, I'm supposed to talk to them directly about my problem with them? At each of the sites, we, um, you know, require our contracted programs to post our 311 sign. This is the opportunity for the youth also to communicate with us outside of contacting the uh, facility if they should have a particular issue with the f facility. Um, one of the, another op option that they have in terms of being certified is that each of the programs needs to have a grievance policy on site. And that grievance policy is supposed to be um, read and signed off by the um, youth at the facility once they are being intake into the facility, which gives them the opportunity to understand how they can communicate externally if they should have a um, concern. So a lot of our um, concerns have been coming through um, 311 to our Youth Connect hotline, as well as through um, our commissioner's um, hotline, so that we can address them in an expeditious manner. So many, um, many city agencies have ombudsmen so that people can anonymously or can directly contact someone who is an advocate on their behalf. What is your reluctance to having an ombudsman um, for homeless and runaway youth? We are fully in support of the goals of this bill. We, we really feel that, the, that this is met through the existing commitments. And I think if you, you know, in, in my experience, you know, people aren't afraid to complain to DYCD or this or that. I think if you talk to providers or you talk to, um, that they will feel that Randy, as the RHY services co coordinator, is fully responsive and accountable to every young person's complaint that has come through. And I think the fact that they are more directly con 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 connected with their service provider lets Randy's role be like the ombudsman for the services that they're getting. So again, because we don't provide the service directly unlike other city agencies, it's, it's really, it's more often than not if they're raising a concern to us that it's a concern about something the provider has, you know, they've experienced with the provider. Mm -hmm. And I think that you'll find that both young people who've had concerns and providers feel really comfortable with the expediency and fairness and clarity that Randy responds. So I want to be clear, we agree with this. Young people have to have a way to um, express their concerns. We agree 100%. And I feel also 100% confident that those that goal is being met through Randy's service. And so who do you report these, um, these complaints and incidents to once, they, once it comes to your attention? Do, is there any reporting mechanism and to whom is it? 
In terms of incidents that, are, that come to my attention, um, first I review them, then I review them with my team, and then we investigate them to make sure that they're being um, addressed and resolved in an expedition manner. If they should happen to be um, incidents that alarm you know, more action, then I communicate that with my supervisor, who is the uh, Deputy Commissioner um, Susan Haskell, so that it can then go up the chain of being addressed as well as being um, uh, you know, informed with throughout the agency. So that's the process that we have. But a lot, most of the incidents that have come in um, have been addressed and resolved, and usually within 24 hours of receipt. And is this data collected anywhere <coughs> by anyone? Yes, okay. it is co correct. So we could get um, the numbers of complaints and the type of complaints and when they mm -hmm. typically sort of come in, we could, we could get that? And that's for all of your contracted facilities? Everything to do with runaway and homeless youth, Randy would be responsible for. And we would be tracking the number of incident reports, for example. I know you do a monthly review of that. The um, 311 phone calls, the Youth Connect phone calls. And we have a record of those that, that we, we could compile and share. Is this information shared with the State Office of Family and, and Children's Services? The I'm in communication with the state regularly through, through, through certification. However, we have a, a regular monthly meeting where we talk about all incidents that or um, situations that need addressing. And so all incidents that are reported are handled internally by DYCD, by your office? Yes. All incidents for runaway and homeless youth. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask this question of you also. Um, what would the anticipated cost be if we have established an ombudsman's office, um, you know, inclusive of all the resources that you would need to have a, a functional office that could address the needs 24 hours a day? I'm trying to wondering if you're trying to ask me if I need a raise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we, we don't, or, we haven't we crossed don't. that out. We yeah. feel really, we feel that that role is being met, that that role is being met right now with our current. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Or, or a change of title. Randy has had <laughs> Randy has had four promotions in the last some like sixteen months. I don't think we can bring him any higher. <laughs> he's he's Actually, a, he's great at yeah. his job, and he's and as a former provider, he really cares about young people. He they're in good hands with Randy. And actually, I actually um, came to government from Project Hospitality, which is one of the providers in your um, your district. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, is there any recourse for, um, for young people who the Office of Children and Family Services are not able to serve? Um, I, I guess this, these are the court-mandated um, court young people that OFCS, um, they, they have a direct connection to their ombudsman. As you know, um, OCFS certifies our residential programs only. Um, they currently have no jurisdiction over our drop-in centers. And our drop-in right. centers um, work with a number of youth in a given year. Mm -hmm. And through the services that we have in Runaway and Homeless Youth, the drop-in youth are able to access the same services as any of our residential, whether they're under OCFS or not. So we treat them all the same in regards to um, their concerns mm -hmm. and managing any incidents that may arise so that they can receive the same and equal services. Okay. You're so good. You did that on purpose. Um, okay. Um, if I can't, it was a good one too. We're not going. We're around. You know how to reach us. Well, um, I, you know, I, I want to thank you um, for for your testimony. Um, it's been helpful. I know that uh, the testimony will be reviewed um, by our council, and, um, and I'm sure you'll be hearing back from us. 
Um, and I'd like it if someone could stay behind to hear what the advocates have to say on this um, particular website. Thank you. <laughs> You're the designated, yeah, listener, right? Okay. Um, so I guess, did we? So um, I, I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Give the commission of my regards. Will do. Oh, um, could you um, give us um, the sign that you have? Oh, and, and, I, and I need to say this before you leave. Um, you have to do a better job of letting people know what resources there are, because um, you know, surveying young people in terms of Youth Connect, they don't know what that is. They they really don't know what that is, and so it's not a a, a valuable resource if they don't know what it is and how to you know to access it. Um, the same with the. Um, the young people in the runaway and homeless, the tills and the drop-in centers, you know, um, a piece of paper on a bulletin board um, in a stationary location isn't really, I, I think, the best way of letting someone know that there's a, a resource and a service and that their rights are, you know, they have a right to make that call. Um, when they enter in do, into the, uh, the um, facility, uh, are they given like a, a bill of rights? Well, when I go to the hospital, they tell me, you know, what my rights are and I have all the phone numbers that, you know, I need. At each site, they are given a um, program manual which provides them with information on how to um, access services, proceed with um, any information that they should complaints, yeah, yeah. complaints, grievance policy, mm -hmm. as I mm -hmm. mentioned earlier. So they are given that mm -hmm. information once um, intake is um, completed mm -hmm. by the provider agency. Mm -hmm. So please take back to the commissioner that we need to have um, um, uh, to look at distribution of how you know um, people are made aware of what the resources are, especially Youth Connect. And with that said, that doesn't mean this is the last conversation we'll have about the hotline. Thank you. Uh, and our next panel will be Jamie Povovich, Povovich from the Coalition for Homeless Youth. Jelia, Gilia Miller? Jenna? Jenna? Oh, Jenna, that's an N. I'm sorry, Jenna. Um, from Advocates for Youth New York. And Beth Hoffmeister from the Legal Aid Society and Coalition for the Homeless. Um, when you take your place, please, uh, um, we'll be sworn in, and you don't have to be. Okay, good for you. That means we, we trust you more than the administration. Um, could you uh, identify yourself before, um, and then you may resume your testimony? Sure. Good morning. My name is Jamie Polovich, and I am the executive director of the Coalition for Homeless Youth, also known as CHY. Um, CHY has advocated for the needs of runaway and homeless youth across New York State for nearly 40 years. The coalition is comprised of 60 providers of services to homeless youth across New York State. 29 of our members are here in New York City. Our members include providers that are directly contracted to provide services to runaway and homeless youth, as well as agencies that intersect with the larger runaway and homeless youth population within the larger scope of their work. I would like to thank you, Chair Rose, for um, holding today's hearing, as well as the absent members of the Youth Services Committee. Um, 
for bringing these two bills forth, and I also would like to thank Speaker Johnson, as you did, for his ongoing commitment to the needs of young people experiencing homelessness. I will limit my testimony um, to just in regards to intro 713. Um, in my testimony that I put forth, there is some background information, but I'm just gonna kinda jump to the bill info. You're welcome. So at this time, the Coalition for Homeless Youth supports the design and implementation of a method for homeless young people to report grievances and obtain information that can support them in navigating systems and alleviating crisis. Although we applaud the council for their willingness to create an ombudsman position with the intent of supporting homeless young people, we feel that given the needs of today's youth and the many ways in which they access information, that an ombudsman would not be the best way to achieve the desired outcome of the bill under consideration today. Young people that are experiencing homelessness are often dealing with a plethora of issues and are regularly in crisis. When a young person reaches out for help or guidance, they are looking for support, answers, and results immediately. Although this is not always feasible, it is the outcome that they desire. An ombudsman's job is more to collect information, rely resources to address the issue presented, and report the interaction. Their ability to immediately assist to alleviate crisis or de-escalate a situation is often limited. Instead of creating an ombudsman position within DYCD, we would recommend that DYCD expand their current Youth Connect hotline to operate 24 hours a day so that it can serve as a tool that can address many of the intended outcomes of Intro 713 and can also support youth in real time with their needs. Currently, there is no hotline available to homeless youth 24 seven, despite there being a need for one. The Coalition for Homeless Youth has seen a significant increase in the amount of calls, emails, and Facebook messages that we receive from young people, parents, and service providers looking for support. Based on our, really my, relationships with the runaway and homeless youth community and with DYCD, we can support the best way possible, but based on our limited capacity, it is not something that is within our regular scope of work. Currently, the Youth Connect hotline provides resources and referrals for youth-related services in New York City, but only during business hours. By extending its hours and changing its structure to operate more like a crisis hotline, it would give youth and the general community a resource to report complaints, obtain general information, and get real-time support with issues related to homelessness, such, such as finding a bed or a safe place to go. In addition, if Youth Connect could expand to have the ability to facilitate communication with youth via social media and text messaging, that would be ideal. Obviously, young people communicate a little bit different than they did many years ago. Lastly, we appreciate the intent of the bill to provide additional oversight of the services being provided by the DYCD runaway and homeless youth contracted providers. However, we see this proposed oversight as a duplication of the oversight that is already happening. Since the first draft of this bill was introduced over a decade ago, DYCD has introduced their, I'm sorry, DYCD has increased their program monitoring to monthly and does field, and does field program spe specific complaints directly from youth, which they kind of testified to how that looks. Um, in conclusion, the coalition is grateful to the city council for its ongoing commitment to runaway and homeless youth. We look forward to our continued work together to improve the city's runaway and homeless youth services. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Jenna Miller. I'm a staff attorney and Equal Justice um, Works Fellow in the School Justice Project at Advocates for Children of New York. At AFC, I support families of students who are involved in bullying incidents in school through direct representation, community education, and policy advocacy. I have a special focus on LGBTQ students and students with disabilities. We appreciate City Council's attention to this significant issue, and um, I'm offering testimony today primarily on 376A because that's, that's really the focus of my organization. 
We're concerned that this introduction, proposing a hotline and mobile application, would duplicate the efforts of the New York City Department of Education and unintentionally make it harder for families to report complaints related to bullying. DYCD representatives already went over um, the pathways that already exist to make, um, to make complaints about bullying for families or students who do not make complaints at school or feel they are not being heard within their school. Um, and some of those efforts, the DOE has announced that it will expand um, those options in 2019. We're also concerned because the bill does not include necessary training for personnel who would respond to complaints on the proposed hotline and mobile application. In our experience, people who are involved in bullying incidents may be in or near crisis, and staff must be properly trained to support these people. We also think that the city should invest in building positive, inclusive school climates by meaningfully implementing anti-bullying trainings. State law and the chancellor's regulation already require that each school have at least one staff member who is an anti-bullying resource for students and staff. In the DOE, this person is called the Respect for All or an RFA liaison. The RFA liaison is required to get training to identify how to report and stop bullying and then turn key the training to all staff and all students by October 31st of each year. Some RFA liaisons report to our organization that they don't feel confident enough in their own training to train their colleagues and how to prevent, identify, report, and most importantly to stop bullying. In AFC's experience, a number of schools don't turn key this training and even when they do, the training isn't enough for staff to prevent and address bullying. For example, it's been our experience that some school staff don't report bullying because they struggle to differentiate bullying from other behavior. And many school administrators aren't adequately trained to investigate and address bullying. We recommend that the DOE review delivery of RFA liaison training, that they provide more support to RFA liaisons, including compensation or relief from other obligations, and that the DOE better monitor the completion and the efficacy of respect for all, liais or respect for all trainings themselves. The city should also invest in evidence-based whole school approaches to improving school climate, like collaborative problem solving. We call on city council to work with the mayor to negotiate a final budget that invests at least a million dollars per year in whole school collaborative problem solving trainings. Research shows that these trainings promote positive school climate and inclusive learning environments where bullying is prevented and addressed. It also develops the skills of students and staff to develop healthy relationships, constructively resolve conflict and deescalate behavior. The mayor's leadership team on school climate and discipline already recommended that the DOE implement these trainings in their 2015 and 2016 reports. And while we appreciate the DOE's plans to, explan to expand whole district collaborative problem solving trainings to three additional districts, the city and the DOE hasn't yet invested in a long-term strategic plan with funding to build capacity to roll out these trainings to all schools in the Department of Education. And the city can start by can start doing that by investing a million dollars for whole school trainings in collaborative problem solving in the fiscal year 2019 budget. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Good morning. My name is Beth Hoffmeister, and I am a staff attorney in the Homeless Rights Project at the Legal Aid Society. I'm testifying on behalf of Legal Aid and also uh, Coalition for the Homeless, our client. They were unable to be present today. Um, as everyone else, we want to thank uh, the Youth Services Committee and uh, Council Member Rose, the chair, for making runaway and homeless youth, in particular, such an important part of the early months uh, of this um, kind of new, you know, crew of uh, council members who are working on these issues. We and we really appreciate. Um, Obviously, Council Member, uh, co excuse me, Speaker Johnson and his staff for all the work they've done. Um, in addition to Council Members Chin and Van Bremer, who've been present in a lot of the hearings and have heard, in particular, the youth speak directly about their experiences. So, like everyone else, um, I will skip to the bill that I'm here to speak about today, which is Intro 713. 
certainly as an attorney, I appreciate the importance of having an independent person that youth and other people who are feeling disenfranchised by a system can go to and complain about issues and, and seek a remedy that they might not be able to seek in other ways. Um, we really believe in that value. We believe in the spirit of what, as, as Jamie said, the spirit of what's really behind 713. We don't believe that an ombudsman is probably the way to go about doing it specifically. Um, as class counsel for ongoing litigation with the city in regards to runaway and homeless youth, we do have a different kind of access to DYCD to solve problems, and we do that regularly as actually as they laid out here. But we understand that not every youth is going to come to us. As Jamie testified here, some of the youth are going to her, and that there really needs to be a better way to address these issues. Um, I myself call Randy Scott. I've given Randy Scott's number to people before. He is available to youth and people who are having issues as they come up, that is true. Um, I'm a big believer in general, and I think our position is that you can't have one person in particular be the, the place that every complaint goes, um, and that it would be a good idea to somehow institutionalize or adjust how those complaints are being, are being made. Um, Coalition for the Homeless, who I'm also testifying on behalf of today, is the shelter monitor for the Department of Homeless Services shelter system. We would suggest that that is a, a way um, to have independent oversight over a, a system in general is to have an outside monitor. We just saw Governor Cuomo um, do that with NYCHA uh, this past week, and that, that is another way to think about um, implementing basically the exact same uh, oversight goals that an ombudsman or an ombuds person, as we would suggest they be called, would do. Um, however, we're not sure that that might also be the best fit for this particular system, so one of the things that Jamie testified to was expanding the role of Youth Connect so that it would be a 24-hour hotline, that there, I think very importantly, would be an opportunity for youth who are looking for a bed to be able to call this number, and that person who would be answering the phone would be able to identify where they could go in that moment, because so often the youth are in these moments of crisis when they're calling. Either they're very upset about an issue that's just happened, they need a place to sleep, and as someone who's dealing with those issues myself, um, during the day and sometimes into the evening to help them out. It would be really helpful if there was one place that youth could go for complaints, for getting a bed, for figuring out where the nearest drop-in is all the time, and that would be a way to do it. But it, but it would have to be expanded and changed um, in order to address that. And I think also we know we don't know how much all of these different things would cost, but that might be the most cost-effective way to address some of the needs that are still outstanding in the system. Um, and a system that we believe, uh, we know, is hopefully going to, with the new budget, have additional beds for different age ranges and groups of people, which is very exciting. We want to seek youth uh, shelter and services, and we want to make sure that as many beds and as many services <clears throat> as possible are being opened up in that way, as opposed to maybe spending money on some other things um, that, that, that maybe uh, those costs could uh, be better used elsewhere. So we're happy to answer any questions that you have, and thank you again for letting us testify today. Thank you all. Thank you for um, testifying um, and being that you're on the front line and you're out there. Um, I want you to know your testimony is valued. I, so it seems to be the consensus that um, we don't need um, a, a dedicated hotline for bullying. Is that is that what? being said, and that um, we could expand upon um, the existing Youth Connect services, right? So um, in its current iteration, it is not effectively addressing the issues that our young people are, are experiencing. You're talking about So none of <laughs> So if any of you thought you were going to run away from this hearing. <laughs>
You are now captives. <laughs> I'm sorry. You are going to respond. So yeah, I think to expand Youth Connect in its current form to be act more as a comprehensive 24-hour crisis-driven hotline, and I think that also to emphasize the, cr the crisis piece as well, because I think also in its current form, Youth Connect is a resource sharing um, platform, which I think you mentioned isn't always useful, right? When I'm a young person and I'm looking for something, the answers I don't want are a list of numbers, a list of addresses, I don't even know how I'm gonna get there, and someone may not even pick up when I do call those numbers. We need it to act as a function that when young people are calling, accessing a bed or with a grievance about a program that the person on the receiving end can really help support whatever the young person is calling about. Um, and I think, you know, I didn't testify about the bullying hotline, but I think a lot of the things that are in that bill, right, could also be supported with the expansion of Youth Connect as well. And that's just another, um, another thing that the hotline could assist with. I mean, I think when I think of hotlines, you know, something similar, although that I know that's a very complex system, like the domestic violence hotline, right? When someone is in crisis, when they are in violence, as young people often are as well, right? They're calling to get an immediate support to the situation that they're in. And that hotline does that, right? Like after an assessment on the phone, they are immediately connected to the resource that can meet their need, although not always perfectly, right? And then there is usually a resolution at the end, even if that resolution at times is that there is no beds available, at least that, that person knows that getting off the phone call. And I think what Beth was saying, I myself have contacted Randy Scott many a times as well as a provider and in this current role, and he is amazing at picking up and helping support those um, calls that he's received, but I, I also think about the many young people that aren't already attached to the DYCD system that don't know Randy Scott, they don't know his cell phone, they don't even know where the drop-in centers are, and having one centralized number that they can call, text hopefully, Facebook message, right? to kind of get the answers that they need. I think that also, when we talk about homeless young people, we also are talking about young people that oftentimes struggle with substance use or with mental health issues. These are young people that will call and they don't have a lot of patience a lot of times to deal with 311, to deal with numerous transfers, not knowing what option to press. Um, and so having kind of a centralized place to field the calls where they can get real time advice and support, I think, would literally be a lifesaver for some young people. Um, and, and how do most of you get um, your referrals or, or your clients, uh, consumers? Well, I don't work directly with young people, okay. um, but I think that when you just kind of Google homeless youth yeah. in New York City, my website comes up a lot. Um, and so, like I testified to, we have been getting an increase of emails directly to the coalition or Facebook messages off our Facebook page from young people themselves. We are statewide, so it isn't always New York City focused. And they're, they're in crisis, right? Like, mm -hmm. they need help. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I am not perfect either, but I've been in this field for over a decade, and so I think that I do bring with me the relationships with other runaway mm -hmm. homeless youth providers, so a lot of times I am able to kind of like immediately connect them. So are most of the um, interactions you have based on referrals, like referrals from the Youth Connect, um, the Youth Connect line? Um, um, how do people find you? How... How do people find? Um, I mean, I think legal aid in general are so big that it, mm -hmm. that in gen, I, I think there's a lot of court, you know, court appointed lawyers are an easy way that people get hooked up with us. But um, specifically in the Homeless Rights Project, you know, we've been doing the work with Coalition for the Homeless in particular yeah. since the 1970s, since the Right to Shelter was established and have been class counsel on those cases for so long. Um, but we have a, a hotline that appears, I mean, we, we deal primarily with a lot of adult shelter eligibility issues, and we've only probably in the past six years been more involved in the youth shelter um, issues, but most of our clients uh, we're dealing with have um, le legal issues that arise out of their eligibility into going into shelter, into family shelter mm -hmm. in particular, is, as you know, is a very difficult 
process to go through, and also um, clients who are dealing with safety issues and need transfers or um, have disabilities and can't be that can't be met in their current placements, things like that. And then we also partner with Coalition for the Homeless that has a daily intake um, at 129 Fulton Street in Manhattan, where they'll take anyone who's in shelter who has any kind of issue and uh, will help a, kind of connect them with what they need, whether that's an ID, whether that's food, whether that's a psychiatric evaluation, what have you. So we work in collaboration with them to make sure we're doing our best to serve the legal and service needs of, of New, York, New Yorkers experiencing homelessness. Um, but we do have a hotline that also um, is on these forums that, that we get calls and help give people information and advice. Um, as you, you know, there's mm -hmm. thousands you, of people in shelter, so we- Do you ever get the complaints that like an ombudsman would, would have dealed it um, sure. Yeah. Okay. I mean, be, when we were doing outreach before we brought our litigation, we, we, we sued the city to try to get a right to shelter for runaway and homeless youth. Mm -hmm. um, and that litigation is still ongoing, but um, we met with hundreds of youth on the street. We were connected with some of them through ad other advocates or providers mm -hmm. and learned a lot about ways that the system could be improved. Um, truth be told, through legislation, obviously, the recent mm -hmm. five bills that were passed, through other changes that DYCD has been making, the system is very different than it was even five years ago mm -hmm. uh, when we really started the litigation, which is a great thing, mm -hmm. and uh, to other commitments that the administration has made to serve um, this population. You know, as, I, as I've joked even with Mayor de Blasio, as an advocate, I always want there to be more than there is because that's part of my job to be, keep pushing. But in a strange way, I think we did get a lot of, and have continued to get a lot of complaints because people know we sued. And so they'll call us about systemic issues. So I do think that there's a value to have an independent person, ideally fielding, you know, fielding that, that information. Yeah, that's because I think the direction I was back. going. Yeah. So um, do you think that there's a, a, enough volume that there could be a person who would handle, you know, those issues and complaints and I mean, the, concerns? The, the youth shelter system is structured very differently than the adult and family and DV and HPD and all, mm -hmm. kind of all the other shelter systems. Um, and part of that is the beauty of what makes it work better for the youth that are involved. And part of that's hard because DYCD as an agency isn't, a, you know, isn't a, equipped in the same way uh, HRA is or, D, or DHS is to kind of deal with large scale you know, kind of shelter projects. So I, I, I'm a little torn because I think I, you know, the Youth Connect option is a great option if that could be expanded. And that would likely be a DYCD employee or employees who would be fielding those calls and dealing with those issues. Um, and it wouldn't kind of have the same oversight function that an, an ombudsperson or a monitor would have. But I'm also always reluctant to kind of create an extra barrier or, or, or a kind of level of bureaucracy that may not actually be effective. So. Um, I think, I don't know that I have the answer right now. I think, I, I hope that when you say this will be part of an ongoing discussion that it really will be to figure out what's the best way with this particular system to make sure youth are being heard, both in the way that Jamie has described, you know, in those crisis moments, but also systemically that issues that can be addressed at a higher level can, can happen. Um, and I, cause, because I do think there are a number of I, options. That, I, so. I think it's a part of the safety net, um, you know, um, I, as an individual in, in a particular organization or, or agency or something, um, have um, a level of, of security to knowing that there's somebody that I can call outside of, you know, the agency itself that will, you know, has my best interest at heart. You know, they're not constrained to the the facility and the guidelines and the personalities and, and things of that nature. And so um, uh, I think that they're doing a yeoman's job, uh, very impressed with, you know, Randy's abilities to to um, respond to, you know, all of the, the issues that are going on, but, um, but he is still a part of that layer. And so, um, and, and you, you know as a lawyer that, you know, oftentimes you need that person who is totally unbiased and, um, and removed from, you know, 
sort of the agency. So um, I, I do plan to continue to have you know this conversation about that, and and I I appreciate the fact that um, I think we all agree that um, the Youth Connect hotline could be greatly expanded and and um, sort of multi-purpose and um, and address some of the needs um, which are there needs to be a dedicated hotline I think for young people who are experiencing bullying um, can I get you guys to agree to that <laughs> well, I, I'm not authorized to talk about the bullying hotline on behalf of League Leader Coalition for the Homeless, but I know you're yeah. here to talk about it. So. I mean, something that I can say is that where we're seeing a really big issue is that young people are experiencing bullying. They're involved in bullying at the school level, and oftentimes there are adults who who see it or are hearing about it and they don't realize that a young person is trying to tell them hey I'm having a problem right now and I need you to help me and um, you know sometimes the, I mean so a part of my project is you know uh, a lot of the young people I represent are students with disabilities and a part of their disability is that they struggle to communicate what they're going through and they really rely on those adults to be their champions and so most New York City youth are in New York City DOE schools and there are, there's in at, there are New York City schools I talk with professionals all the time who tell me I know that there's bullying in my classroom and I don't know how to stop it or I know that there's bullying in my school and I don't know what to do, or, oh my goodness, I didn't realize that this was going on. And um, I think that, you know, a part of that, a, a big part of that is that there aren't enough resources for the kind of training that you need to have difficult conversations with young people. Okay, thank you so much. Um, uh, I, I just need, to just say again that not all of our young people are in DOE schools, and so the service uh, and the outreach needs to be, uh, and the accessibility needs to be all youth in New York City. Thank you all for, um, for coming and testifying today. And our last panel will be Jeff Irvine from Bridget, Michael Cohen, um, Simon, Weisenthal Center, and Jason Siakuto, um, Tyler Clemente Foundation. And I'm sorry if I messed up your name. And while there, oh, you might not be able to leave. Okay, don't everyone run out. <laughs> Thank you. Don't you feel really safe in this building today? Um, so for the record, while um, they're getting to the uh, table to testify, um, we have testimony from um, brave anti-bullying um, for the record and we have a statement um, from Simon Weisenthal although you're um, also um, testifying for the record okay thank you you can identify yourself and begin thank you good morning <laughs> yeah for holding these hearings and taking a necessary and critical proactive stance on, combat on combating the bullying academic epidemic, which is affecting far too many of our children and families. My name is Michael Cohen and I am here this, well, this afternoon now, <laughs> representing the Simon Wiesenthal Center as its East Coast Director. The Simon Wiesenthal Center is a leading global human rights organization confronting anti-Semitism, racism, hate, with a, membership, with a membership constituency of over 400,000 households in the United States and over 150,000 households in the New York metropolitan area. While the Simon Wiesenthal Center has been training both youth and educational professionals on bullying prevention for decades, 
I am here today primarily to focus on an area of bullying that is having a devastating impact on many of our children, online bullying. Until just a few years ago, bullying from peers, from, from peers usually ended, ended at the conclusion of the school day. Not anymore. Social media platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram are leveraged by cyber bullies 24 seven often targeting kids using password-protected platforms and beyond the reach of adult knowledge. Upon, once upon a time, changing schools was an option to escape extreme bullying, but not so much anymore. Social media can, can reach around the world around the corner. A relatively new but important source of hate and bullying now comes with the domain of online gaming. For 24 years, the Simon Wiesenthal Center has produced its annual Digital Terrorism and Hate report providing stakeholders, law enforcement, media, educators, and policymakers such as yourselves a snapshot of, of, of how from the bully next door to an extremist halfway around the world, how they leverage online platforms to promote their hateful agendas. Today, the post-millennial Generation Z has now grown up with a smartphone in their hands and an unprecedented ability to organize, create, and distribute such hateful content. We look forward to supporting your efforts and with your committee and social and, and social media giants with our schools and in order to protect our children, their parents and schools with, with, this distributed, with this disturbing phenomenon and empower our youth with the necessary skills and tools to properly identify and combat online bullying. For two years now, the Simon Wiesenthal Center has been conducting workshops in junior high schools and high schools around the country, educating our youth to enhance their recognition skills of offensive material and to teach them how to avoid being a tar target, bystander, or victim of bullying. The Simon Wiesnall Center has also produced the Combat Hate app, which provides the youth with a direct path to report online bullying and hate, showing them that they can do something constructive in the fight against hate in all its forms. Attached to, your submitted, uh, written, to, the submitted, to our uh, submitted written testimony are printed out screenshots of just a few of the worst examples of digital bullying that our researchers and program managers are coming across on a daily basis. I urge you to look at them and see some of the hate that our children are exposed to when they sign on to such gaming and social media platforms. I want to once again thank the committee for taking the necessary time to properly address the issue of bullying and for taking an aggressive and leading role in searching for meaningful solutions. The Simon Wiesel Center will continue to offer its hand in partnership with these efforts and stands ready, willing, and able to assist the council in this great city in doing everything possible to protect our next generation from the ugl ugliness of this bullying epidemic. Thank you. I'm sorry. Had called you a name. I, I guess you didn't hear it. No, I didn't. Yeah. Hear it. Okay. Um, next. Good afternoon. I'm Jason with the funny last name, uh, Cianciato. Don't worry, it, it, it's uh, it's hard to pronounce. Um, and uh, I'm the executive director of the Tyler Clemente Foundation, and I want to thank you for the invitation to testify, um, uh, and for um, uh, focusing on the issue of bullying. I'm primarily going to be speaking about uh, intro 376A. Can you talk in the, into the mic? Sure. Thank you. There we go. Okay. Um, I think it's important to remember uh, who Tyler Clemente was, uh, given its relationship to this bill. Um, in 2010, Tyler was an 18-year-old uh, freshman at Rutgers University um, who died by suicide after he was cyberbullied by his college roommate. Tyler's death brought unprecedented attention to what was then a relatively new form of cyberbullying, one perpetrated on social media. Shortly after his death, Tyler's parents, Joe and Jane, established the foundation with a vision to create a world that is rooted in kindness and mutual respect and guided by the golden rule to treat others as we want to be treated ourselves. And that vision is manifest in our mission to end online and offline bullying in schools, workplaces, and faith communities. Uh, I am here to express our enthusiastic support for Intro 376A. Um, I know that there's been uh, a lot of conversation already about it that I've learned, particularly regarding the, the phone line. Um, but what I would like to really speak to is the availability of an app for very much the reasons that, that you shared, Chair Rose, that not all students uh, attend schools. Um, and I also think that uh, just as we've seen an increase in cyberbullying on social media, um, we've also seen a decrease in youth's use of websites and more uh, use of apps on their phones or social media to access resources. And I think this is an opportunity for the city to really jump forward into, into that space and meet youth where they're going to get the information that we need. Um, 
these, this tool is critical because uh, our poll in 2016 of 1,000 teens and their parents in the New York City metro area, which we partnered with AT&T to create, found that nearly half of teens in the metro area had been cyberbullied and that 80% knew of someone who had been cyberbullied. So I think the, the, the uh, incidence has only gone up since then. Um, this resource that Intro 376A will create um, uh, will support additional key findings of our poll, um, which is that more than half of New York area teens spend at least three hours a day socializing online, um, that a third prefer to social online, uh, uh, socialize online rather than in person, which as a new father is pretty frightening to me actually, um, and that 86% are most often at home when they socialize online, again speaking to your point, Chairperson Rose. Um, I would love to uh, work with the city and the council to help leverage the resources of the foundation um, to not only support youth via this app who are bullied, but even more important to us to um, uh, prevent bullying from happening in the first place, to address those, prevent those wounds before they happen. Um, and that's really one of the differences between the many wonderful organizations that fight bullying that we partner with and the Tyler Clemente Foundation, that the Clemente family created us to focus primarily on bullying prevention. Um, to that end, since the end of, of 2017, I'm still relatively new at the foundation, I've trained nearly 340 New York City teachers, school counselors, and administrators to implement Day One, which is the foundation's uh, free, easy, and research-based bullying prevention program. Um, day One is available in English, Arabic, Chinese, and Spanish via toolkits customized for grades K through three, four to six, as well as middle and high schools. We also have um, kits that we've partnered with for Boys and Girls Clubs of America. We're gonna be releasing in June a kit for Big Brothers, Big Sisters of America. So we not only um, meet kids where they are in school, but also in the programs they participate in outside of school, such as my son who's in a YMCA after school program. Um, day one consists of students, um, uh, consists of, uh, uh, someone in authority, a person who would be responsible for addressing and monitoring bullying, reading a declaration, which simply states that the space is, is free from harassment, um, violence, and bullying, and lists a, a large number of enumerated characteristics, which we think it's really important for communities disproportionately affected by bullying, like women, people of color, immigrants, LGBTQ people, to hear themselves represented in that declaration, and a call and response, which is part of the research underlying the program. Um, then students read aloud and sign um, uh, the day one version of our Upstander Pledge, where they uh, commit to treating each other with respect and kindness on and offline, um, where they commit to intervening if they see someone being bullied, or to ask for help from someone in authority if they don't feel that it's safe for themselves to intervene, and to reach out to victims of bullying either in person or online to provide support and to encourage those to seek professional help. Um, I think that if this app or other resources that are created um, uh, includes uh, access to these resources, um, perhaps even a links to day one that they might have seen or experienced in school or in their after school programs or in their big brother, big sister program, that New York City could lead the nation in decreasing by prevention bullying. And as you pointed out when we started, we've only seen those incidents go up. Um, in closing, you know, if Tyler lived in a world of upstanders who either never cyberbullied him to begin with, or if just one person reached out to him after he was cyberbullied um, via an app, online, or in person, he might still be alive today. And that's where I see the power of these conversations that are happening and with the city investing in the technology that youth are using today to access each other and to reach out for help. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chairman, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak today. My thank name is you. Jeff Irvine. I'm a New York City taxpayer, and I'm also the founder of Bridget. And Bridget is a social safety system designed for any community to address bullying, harassment, and abuse. The system is research-based. It's data-driven. We've built it over the last five years with some of the leading researchers in the country and some of the best data scientists. You talked about needing data. You talk about opt-in systems. And websites are opt-in systems. Hotlines are opt-in systems. I travel around the country. I just spoke in Austin, Texas before their legislature, in Sacramento before their legislatures. And opt-in systems, 
They work, but only in a very fractional way. If on average every student in the city is bullied, 10% of the city is bullied every day, which the national numbers indicate, and there's 1.1 million students, then there's 100,000 kids a day who are bullied in some way or shape or form. But it doesn't get communicated. And communication is the key. Well, walking into a principal's office, you walk out, what do your friends ask you? Who are you snitching on? Or what are you in trouble for? The social cost of approaching someone on a face-to-face -face basis today is huge. And our social scientists and my psychologists and all the research bears this out. So we have to create clear, safe channels of communication. And communication changes culture. We need to change the culture of the school. We need to redesign the cultures of the school so they're safe. To do that, culture is set at the margin by the student. Students set the culture, not teachers, leaders. Leaders lead where they want the culture to go, but it's student buy-in that sets the social, emotional, health of that community, drives healthy relationships, drives safety. If we get safety right, everything else follows. And that should be our number one job as a taxpayer, as a father, as a, a counselor. These are the things that matter. And we have the technology today to do it. On our platform, and we, we design it for, we just designed a community in New York City just for uh, kids who are in the, um, who are home, not homeless, who are in, um, who are without parents, right? And girls between the ages of nine and 12, uh, between ninth and 12th grade, the riskiest population in the world because when they age out, what happens? Drug abuse, right? Prostitution, suicide, highest rates in the country around the world. And there's 400,000 kids who don't have parents in this country. So we believe that hotlines are necessary, but they already exist at a national level with trained people 24-7, and they gather data in the right way. We need to gather the right data. If everyone's running their own hotline and they're all pulling different data, if you're not pulling data that's aligned with research and with compliance and the, and the laws, then and you can't compile that data and use that data to see trends, then you can't be prescriptive. You can't get ahead of the problem. You can't be preventative, right? And that's what we've designed. It's all about prescriptive analytics, and you tell a superintendent that, and their eyes roll back in their head, right? What you need to say is, I can see that little Johnny or little Jose are going down this path, and I can see it early, and you need to do this exercise, have this conversation, this teachable moment at this time to get them back on track or to identify what's driving it. And it doesn't matter if it's the bully, the victim, or the bystander. They all need support. Bullying is not is not something that's genetic, it's learned. It's a lack of support at home. It's a lack of support in school. You know, everything we're doing is about reconnecting the kids as fast as possible, empowering them so they can set their own culture. To do that, you have to first identify and measure, right, over time, and secondarily, you have to have the resources that are 24-7, and it has to be able to scale. You talk about ombudsman. Ombudsman's an impossible task today in a, in a city of a million one students you know, and, and the teachers and the parents, all that. You need digital help. You need a digital ombudsman or a service bureau that allows that data to flow in real time and allows those resources to flow immediately, almost like Netflix for social emotional learning and safety. And we've created it. We've tagged it based on the problems. And we're, we've, we've been in New York City schools for four years. We've had incredible results. We're rolling out in California, Texas. So, and it's not just the schools. We can take this to the communities. We can take it to the agencies. We can bring all their content, their valuable content to life. We give them the power of Facebook, but you have to be aware of that data privacy. You know, you've got, Her Her uh, you've got uh, COPA, HIPAA, FIPA, Patriot Act, all these things that as you gather this data via the phone lines or otherwise, you have to have privacy officers. You have to have checks and balances. You have to have control over that information because it's health related. And, and that's just the way the national laws are built. So I'm here to say we're here to help. We're here to work with everyone. Our systems can be privatized. They can be a, a put together. But that it does now exist. And that we would hope that you would uh, take us up on talking. And we'll work with Martin Wiesenthal Foundation and others around the country uh, to, do, to do what's right. Because it's about that standardization of data and that standardization of, of, of response. The efficacy of the training, of the interaction, 
of, of the conversation. Does it work in this community versus that community? If I'm in, if I'm in Manhattan or versus Brownsville versus the South Bronx, they're different communities with different needs and, and different ways to communicate. So it's a very complicated problem. A, a hotline is you know, great, but there's so much more we can be doing today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and, and to your point, yes, we, um, a hotline isn't, you know, the optimal, um, it, um, but it, it's, it's a, another pathway to um, addressing the issue. And um, we didn't talk a lot about the cyberbullying, you know, um, end of, of the bullying issue. Um, and so uh, I, I do hope to be able to continue to have this conversation. Because as you've seen, um, DYCD isn't really excited about um, doing, you know, any type of expansion. So um, we're going to have, you know, continuing um, discussions just to see, you know, what, what we can do. Um, and, and my hope is that we can bring all the elements in that we really didn't touch on um, in any great depth today. Um, and in, in terms of the ombudsman, it was for the runaway and homeless youth population. Um, and they're usually um, domiciled in, you know, transitional or temporary or drop-in um, kind of uh, residential program. So I, I want to thank you. Um, we have your testimony. And um, I really do, I really would like to get back to this. Um, and have a, a more full-bodied discussion. So with that, I, I thank you for thank coming you. here today. And um, I just, for the record, I, I want it noted that um, uh, Council Member Van Bramer's legislative director, David Ginsburg, is here listening on his behalf. So um, uh, the information, I'm sure, we'll get back to um, Council Member Van Bramer. And um, with that, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you all for coming. And you can safely take the elevators now. <laughs>